Hello, good morning and welcome to St. Peter's West Knighton for morning prayer. We will be using common worship provision for morning prayer on Friday during ordinary time, which you will find towards the beginning of the Red Book, after prayers during the day, seasons and ordinary, morning and evening prayer, seasons and ordinary. And it's the commemoration of Brook Foss Westcott, it being Friday the 27th of July. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. A song of triumph. O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us heartily rejoice in the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, and be glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have moulded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah on that day at Massa in the wilderness, when your forebears tested me and put me to the proof though they had seen my works. Forty years long I detested that generation and said, This people are wayward in their hearts, they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. So we turn to the back of the Red Book, to the Psalter for the appointed psalmody this morning, number 31. 31. We'll scroll down, of course, if we're using the app. We use the prayers that follow in silence if we have them. Into your hands I commend my spirit. In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, a fortress to save me, for you are my rock and my stronghold. Guide me and lead me for your name's sake. Take me out of the net that they have laid secretly for me, for you are my strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit, for you have redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. I hate those who cling to worthless idols. I put my trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in your mercy, for you have seen my affliction and known my soul in adversity. You have not shut me up in the hand of the enemy. You have set my feet in an open place. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with sorrow, my soul and my body also. For my life is wasted with grief and my years with sighing. My strength fails me because of my affliction and my bones are consumed. I have become a reproach to all my enemies and even to my neighbours, an object of dread to my acquaintances. When they see me in the street, they flee from me. I am forgotten like one that is dead out of mind. I have become like a broken vessel. 
for I have heard the whispering of the crowd. Fear is on every side. They scheme together against me and plot to take my life. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I have said you are my God. My times are in your hand. <clears throat> Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servant and save me for your mercy's sake. Lord, let me not be confounded, for I have called upon you. But let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence. Let speak against the righteous with arrogance, disdain and contempt. How abundant is your goodness, O Lord, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared in the sight of all for those who put their trust in you. You hide them in the shelter of your presence from those who slant them. You keep them safe in your refuge from the strife of tongues. Blessed be the Lord. For he has shown me his steadfast love when I was as a city besieged. I had said in my alarm I have been cut off from the sight of your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my prayer when I cried out to you. Love the Lord, all you his servants. For the Lord protects the faithful but repays to the full the proud. Be strong and let your hearts take courage. All you who wait in hope for the Lord. <coughs> Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Into your hands I commend my spirit. Song of Humility back in morning prayer on Friday. Raise us up, O God, that we may live in your presence. Come, let us return to the Lord, who has torn us and will heal us. God has stricken us and will bind up our wounds. After two days he will revive us, and on the third day will raise us up, that we may live in his presence. <coughs> let us strive to know the Lord. His appearing is as sure as the sunrise. He will come to us like the showers, like the spring rains that water the earth. O Ephraim, how shall I deal with you? How shall I deal with you, O Judah? Your love for me is like the morning mist, <coughs> like the dew that goes early away. Therefore I have hewn them by the prophets, and my judgment goes forth as the light. For loyalty is my desire and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Raise us up, O God, that we may live in your presence. Born in 1825, Westcott was first ordained and then became a master at Harrow School. Whilst there he published a series of scholarly works on the Bible, his expertise eventually leading to his election as Regis Professor of Divinity at the University of Cambridge in 1870. With Fenton Hort and J.B. Lightfoot, he led a revival in British Biblical Studies and Theology. He became influential too in the field of Anglican social thought and was significant in the founding of the clergy training school in Cambridge, later renamed Westcott House in his memory. In 1890 he was consecrated Bishop of Durham where he died on this day in the year 1901. <clears throat> and so to a mighty reading from 1 Samuel 17, 31 to 54. Well, it's a story with which we are familiar, so hopefully it shouldn't drag. 1 Samuel 17 from 31 to 54. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. 
But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and whenever a lion or bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save him from the hand of this Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go and may the Lord be with you. Saul clothed David with his armour. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the army, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I am not used to them. So David removed them, then he took his staff in his hand and chose five smooth stones from the wadi, put them in his shepherd's bag, in the pouch, his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David with his shield-bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog? Did you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of heaven, whom you have defied. This very day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is of the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When the Philistine drew nearer to meet David, David ran quickly towards the battle line to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead, and he fell face down on the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, striking down the Philistine and killing him. There was no sword in David's hand. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine. He grasped his sword, drew it out of its sheath, and killed him. Then he cut off his head with it. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. The troops of Israel and Judah rose up with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Shearim as far as Gath and Ekron. The Israelites came back from chasing Philistines and they plundered their camp. David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. He put his armour in his tent. Although this story doesn't follow those themes of that the prophets do, of obey God, God will be present with you and establish you in the land and that land will provide food for you, <coughs> even an arid land with planted crops, so they very much at the mercy of their God. <coughs> so that's the main theme, if you like in the face of the enemy for the Hebrew people. Be obedient to God, worship him, <clears throat> don't marry foreigners, and so on. Don't worship foreign gods, and then he will abide with you in the selected temple of the time. He will be with you and will establish you on your land, and that land will be productive as long as you are obedient. That's a huge story throughout scripture. But following hard on its heels is one, and it's certainly a theme in almost every story. But here it is. Um, this might be one of those sort of desert island disc narratives from the Hebrew scripture. Because we have somebody trusting in human strength and in false gods who apparently is bound to win. Tall, strong, the scene is set with a description of the weight of his armour. He comes forward with his shield bearer in front of him. The armies are arrayed, as I said yesterday, in that sort of traditional pre-First World War, well, even World War I, but as it sort of after that, it fell apart a little, where the armies would come out, array themselves, with much shouting and drumming and flag waving and charging. And then when the whistle went effectively, 
they would charge at each other and sooner or later decide they would stop and decide who'd won and whether that meant that the land was won, whether the field was won and how, whatever. So we've got these battle lines. There's an obvious winner. And David tells his king, offers his services to his king, who says he can't do it. He says, I have done it, so he's had practice. He has looked after sheep. He has killed lions and bears with his bare hands. So he has confidence in his own physicality. But he immediately says that the Philistine will be like this. He is uncircumcised and has defied the armies of the living God. <clears throat> so there's a sort of an anger and a vengeance and a zeal for holiness. <clears throat> and as David approaches the Philistine, the Philistine swears, but David says, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. <clears throat> so even though David has described his strength he doesn't put his faith in that he puts his faith in God and then the most unlikely ways as David walks up I don't know whether it's a long walk like a fast bowler or whether it was a short walk and quite how he selected his stones whether there were hours or whether it was a matter of seconds but he puts these five stones in his pouch takes one are we to read that they are the five books of the law? Or do they represent some other five? One, in which case which, was taken and struck the Philistine and sunk into his forehead and he collapsed. And then David cuts the Goliath's head off, the giant's head off with his own sword, which was too heavy for David to carry. So he didn't rely on human strength, it was cumbersome. The king offered hopeless help. And then the other Philistines fled and were massacred. God gave a victory. And the Philistine army was left to the birds to eat. Quite an extraordinary story. And although it's gruesome and it's cast in this theatre of war, it should be of hope to diminishing congregations under the pressures of having to look after buildings and raise finances where they may feel themselves mocked by powers too great for them. With an indifference, people trying to help, but inappropriately. May we who choose to stand as individuals in frighteningly difficult circumstances with faith, with bereavement, or with office politics, or challenge of a terminal illness, loss of an assumed income, broken relationships. May we speak as David did, a word of faith to give ourselves courage and to enable us to see the situation in the light of God's protection and provision. Whether we are rescued as David and his people were in this circumstance, the truth remains that we must trust in God's power. God is with and for us. Perhaps as homework we, we might read St. Patrick's Breastplate. Luke 24, our second reading, from 13 to 35. Luke 24, from 13 to 35. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognising him. He said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, his name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them what things. They replied the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. 
But we had hoped he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group have standed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that he had indeed, they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it was just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. <coughs> as they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? <coughs> that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Here again, perhaps another significant passage of scripture like the previous, perhaps hidden array, perhaps <coughs> unremarkable at first glance, but similar in that there's an impossibility um, that there's a, what you think is going to happen doesn't, there is a hidden victory unfolding before our eyes. There are certain truths. People didn't recognise Jesus. You would think that they would. They didn't recognise him. You would think that after his death and after he's resurrected, he would have lost his injuries, but they are with him. We find them walking along. These two. Jesus goes up. They don't recognise. He asks what they're talking about. They say, the only one who doesn't know. And then they explain Really powerfully, Jesus of Nazareth was a mighty prophet, but the chief priests condemned him to death. We had hoped he would redeem Israel. Unusually, in talking to the disciples, who don't normally understand what on earth is going on, these two, who are apparently not disciples of the twelve, do completely get it, and they give a very succinct summary. I would expect Jesus as a leader would have been very pleased to have had that summary of his mission. However, it doesn't sound like he's pleased. He says they are foolish and slow of heart. But then he explains to them the word. So if you are of an evangelical disposition within Anglicanism, you would say that salvation comes from hearing. And if you're a close evangelical preaching, being preached by a male, <coughs> as Jesus was male, salvation comes from hearing the word of God. And there they are, they are hearing the word of God. And quite often this that is overlooked in this story because um, it's called the road to Emmaus and there's that Emmaus supper um, picture can't think of the name of the chap I don't want to say the wrong thing because I might sound like a pastor sort if I get it wrong but um, there are all sorts of pictures of the supper of Emmaus and in that if you are more of a traditionalist high church person we would say that we meet God in the mass in the Eucharist or the breaking of bread where Jesus' body and blood are, where his death is reenacted, remembered. And so we've got those two significant um, expressions of faith, the sacrament of the word, the ministry of the word and the ministry of the sacrament, both held together as ways of understanding and knowing Jesus, tied together just as Anglican services that our Holy Communion services do half the services of the word and half of the bread and wine. And then there's extraordinary passages, one line, he vanished from their sight. So they didn't recognise him until he was breaking bread and then something fell into place. But then as soon as they saw they recognised him, he vanished. I don't know quite how you would do that, whether it would be a Disney-esque puff of smoke. But then they say, when our hearts burn within us, reminiscent of the Wesley story of his heart being strangely warmed, 
hearts were burning within us while he was talking to us. Can I, I certainly, it's one of those things that one might uh, meditate on, how it must have felt to them being spoken to by a stranger or somebody who they perceived as a stranger who actually they knew talking about those things that were deep and deeply meaningful, important to them. Hearing Jesus preach the whole scripture, would our hearts not be warmed? May that be an encouragement to us, just as David's apparently impossible situation came good. So the apparently impossible situation that immediately preceded this is coming good. And it's the realisation of that. Right when the Hebrew armies watch the Philistine fall in slow motion and realise the implications and then they start to make their way forward. So in this fog of uncertainty and loss, gradually Jesus is breaking through. Just as in our lives of brokenness and hurt and suffering, if we hear the word, if we receive the sacrament, we may be blessed and emboldened, encouraged and healed. That that in our sending out may be the experience of the world, the community in which we live. And so as we walk our lonely road of loss, as we find those things in which we had believed and taken from us. We may know people for whom that is the case. Let us turn back to morning prayer on Friday as we repeat the refrain together. Forsake me not, O Lord, be not far from me, O my God. Forsake me not, O Lord, be not far from me, O my God. Make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. Be not far from me, O my God. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Forsake me not, O Lord, be not far from me, O my God. The Song of Zechariah. Give your people knowledge of salvation, O God, by the forgiveness of all their sins. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Saviour, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets God promised of old, to save us from our enemies, from the hands of all that hate us, to show mercy to our ancestors, and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath God swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. And you, child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of all their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Give your people knowledge of salvation, O God, by the forgiveness of all their sins. Let us pray. Sovereign, Saviour, Advocate. One in three, three in one. We thank you for the newness of life that you bring. We thank you that on that Good Friday, echoed quietly through the year on every Friday, we remember that exchange <coughs> where you gave life for death, that we who had no choice but death may receive life, that you who belonged became isolated. That we who were lost may be found. You had health became broken. That we who were sick may be well. You who were rich became poor. That we in poverty may be provided for. And so on and so on. And we pray for uh, 
fellow believers around the world, especially those of the Christian faith, who are following in the way of tears and even now are facing death, experiencing pain, exclusion, who are following after you, not in and um, particularly in a particular. Uh, The word was there, but it's gone in a provocative way to gain attention or to raise points. But people simply trying to live, but finding themselves at enmity with their family, religion, view, policy, <coughs> that of their fellow villagers, or the state, or the warring factions that would have them take sides. We pray for organisations who would seek to relieve them of their plight, to provide for them and protect them. I pray for a change of heart for the persecutors. Continue to pray for, operation, for Japan using Operation World. <coughs> they claim, the writers claim, it faces many crises, lacking a morality. Young people have social anxiety. There are over 30,000 suicides a year amongst youngsters. There's high rates of teenage prostitution. There's also suicides elsewhere in the society and high rates of divorce. We thank you that the church, that you have an answer, a part of an answer to those Issues and we pray for missionaries working out there that they may have opportunities to directly confront that sense of loss, and grief, hopelessness, and pain with your offer of healing, wholeness, and belonging. The political leadership is characterized by factional dynamics rather than nation builders. The legacy of World War II apparently holds back the government in many ways. It's the world's third largest economy, but has been rocked by recession in recent years. There's a lack of natural resources, but now there is increasing competitive high-tech. There is, they find themselves in an increasingly competitive high-tech market. Changes in age structure also make for an uncertain future. So we pray for those who have responsibility to lead and direct the people of Japan. They will have courage, <coughs> wisdom, your guidance. They will have an understanding of the situation and the issues and be enabled to put things in place to potentially head things off at the pass, as it were. To either step down or step back in some areas, press on in others, that the nation will continue to be able to thrive and prosper. One of those elements is the population is increasing, but also there are problems with crime rates which have significantly increased in recent years, we pray, for the policing of that land <coughs> and an awareness of individuals that they may care for themselves and that those who do commit crimes may be brought to justice. Christian Action Research and Education, we give thanks for all who contribute to the life of villages through neighbourly care, protecting the environment and serving voluntary groups and churches to raise funds, organise events, provide support and share the love and truth of the gospel. And our amen to that. From Green Christian on the 27th. A modern waste stream includes textiles, packaging, plastic, glass, metals, concrete, steel, wood, ashes, tyres and all electronic waste generated in this information age. Extended producer responsibility is an approach that makes companies responsible not just for creating goods but for managing them post use. EPR could also help to reduce e waste. Some companies, such as Interface, voluntarily seek to retrieve their products for recycling. Formalising this into law would encourage companies to think now about what will happen then and to make their products longer lasting, easy to fix, and as recyclable as possible. I pray that that idea will become enshrined in 
laws and uh, policies around the world. Thank you for those companies that are already heading in that direction. And our benefit cycle of prayer. We pray for charities such as Christian Aid, Open Doors, Prison Fellowship and Farm Community Network as they look out for and care for Christians and others who find themselves on their uppers. And pray, continue to pray for our church membership, this time half of those in Ermine, for Jenny and Warren, Mike and Pam, Penny and Dave, Anne and John, Bob, Susan and Timothy, Gerald and Valerie, Martin and Anne, Pam, Eve, Tessa, David and Wendy, Christine, Richard, June, Robin, Pete and Wendy, Heather, Derek, Jill, Roger and Hilary. And pray for each of these, that they may know your health, wealth, prosperity, your salvation, healing and deliverance. We thank you for what they give to their communities and to the church, through their time, talents and money. We pray for those for whom things are not going so well, that they would know to call on you and that your presence would help them in their circumstance directly and your presence in caring Christian and other neighbours would also make a difference. We pray for those amongst these things for whom things are going well, they may turn to those in need and offer assistance. Where they do that in your name, may your kingdom grow. Where they do it for themselves, may community become established. And we pray with them that you'll become the main motivator in their lives, our lives. That you'll give us a hunger and a thirst and you'll prioritise you, that you are our identifier. That other issues, uh, efforts, memberships, if you like, come second. And we pray that in that, that our zeal and commitment in our love, our passion, that others will be drawn to you and that we will find our lives that bit more fulfilled as we follow our calling that only we can follow more closely. That we may be more fulfilled. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I shall see you through a camera as a machine to the body where I wish, but as I'm here, say, Harry of us. Have a shamas and was a horribish with a messy and yes, if you wish from her, such a head as a mass of water. I should promise my shamas with you, which may have seen you to have as much of a heart son. I shall see the quicker of us, but I shall not have a mess and I shall see my husband for so you to wish my head. And <laughs> Gracious Father, you gave up your Son out of love for the world. Lead us to ponder the mysteries of his passion, that we may know eternal peace through the shedding of our Saviour's blood, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but to deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless us and preserve us from all evil and keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God.